Just like I told them last night, I'm always proud to be back in the Republic of Texas. <laughs> it, <clears throat> and as I travel uh, to other states, I tell them that Texas is such a generous state, they allow the other states to join them. <laughs> Including Alaska. <laughs> it really is a privilege to be here. I'm very, uh, I loved my time of teaching here in Dallas and still miss it, but um, I come back because they have that problem with too many hogs and white tail and black bucks, and I try to help with the problem. <laughs> Successful, I might add. We're obviously, and we, we've been hearing it throughout the day, and that video that we had just a few minutes ago, uh, there's a big problem in our culture, and it's not only, and this is partly true, but it's not only because I'm getting old and I want to complain about the modern times, and in fact I'm vying for the job of being one of the two old guys in the balcony at the Muppets movie. <laughs> but there, there really is a, a decline in our culture. And it's hard to avoid, and it's not just that I look back on the good old days. Just in some simple indicators, uh, there is a great decrease in scientific knowledge, math, social studies, history. It's, it's just amazing that the tests that we took, the ACTs and such, way back in the 60s, they cannot pass anymore. They, they bring them down about every five years so that people can pass. And more people get to college that probably shouldn't be there. And there are other things to do besides go to college and those things are not offered. There's a tremendous change in family. When I was born, Back in the late 40s, the uh, rate of out of wedlock birth was 4%. By 1960, it had gone up to 5%. But today, it is 52% of all children are born out of wedlock. That's a huge change. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. And we are definitely dealing with the results of the 1960s double revolution. At the end of the 1960s, we saw the sexual revolution and the drug revolution. And they both continued to devastate the culture. They were not the boons that the posters made them out to be. It's not make love and not war, we do both. And it's been an increasingly violent culture. Murder rates are much higher than they were in the 40s and 50s. We also are, are seeing with the drug revolution, uh, a lot of you may have heard how Karl Marx had written, actually it was in his dissertation on Hegel back in 1847, when Marx wrote, religion is the opiate of the people. Now, in increasing number of states besides California, Washington, Colorado, but more and more states, now you have the politicians teaching, opiates are the opiates of the people as they keep on legalizing more drugs, or drugs in more places. And it is not a boon. I mean, they're against smoking cigarettes and tobacco, 
but smoking marijuana where you hold the smoke in your lungs even longer than you do tobacco smoke is not going to be an improvement of health yet alone of mental health these are not good things and we're seeing in a lot of surprising ways how there is a turning against the general culture that we've inherited and a move towards ever greater individualism more and more the focus is on the experience of the individual and the national and societal concerns and the obviously to break down a family the family concerns are not as important as what's good for me I need time for me is an increasing situation I need to find myself I need to be myself want eh, give us a chance to vote on that too <laughs> might not be all that much an improvement there's this tremendous change and the most significant change that has taken place in our culture is this move towards relativism I have been speaking about this issue for decades and exactly the things that I said were going to happen are happening in ways that were just obvious because of the inherent logic of relativism. Let me just define my terms. Relativism is a belief on the positive side that all truth is relative. On its more negative formula, they teach that there is no such thing as objective truth objective truth does not exist now of course within that system that would accept their own theory because as soon as you say there is no objective truth you've just made an objectively true statement <laughs> and of course that points out the inherent illogic of relativism that is taught but the other side of that problem is not just that we can point out that they are illogical far more important is the fact that they are blind to their own illogic they don't see it and furthermore they become more absolutist than our people who believe that truth exists they cannot tolerate disagreeing with them and this is absolutely key to understand why is that if there is no absolute truth or if truth is relative then you end up saying as so many people do and watch for this in commercials by the way that's one of the ways commercials are very interesting ways to give you a window into what actually appeals to people the people who make commercials are the real money makers in the media they know how to appeal to people they know the values that are effective in making sales and that's how you listen to commercials how are they appealing and some appeals are fairly obvious that's why at times I'm yelling at my television Victoria keep it a secret I don't need to see this I'm eating my breakfast 
especially at Valentine's Day time. But there are others that are less obvious. And one aspect of this appeal is I have my truth and you have your truth and we are going to be able to get along because I let you have your truth and you let me have mine. This is your reality, this is my reality, and we'll get along so long as we accept the way we each see it. This indicates a certain amount of fear to make an objective statement. There's a point that I'll make later on, but people in this culture are increasingly afraid of holding an opinion because they're afraid that people will get upset and helicopter moms will have to come in and rescue you from a debate on the basis of facts and logic and science. We can't have that. We can't believe in objective truth. So you have your truth, I'll have mine. Now what does that imply? And this is where, think about this principle in the way that Congress is failing to work right now. If I have my truth and you have your truth, and there is no objective truth, then there is no truth in between us upon which we can base a discussion and or argument. If my truth is my world and your truth is your world, and there is no objective truth, we cannot communicate. And this is exactly one of the crises going on within government because you no longer have agreement on the Constitution or the law. And this will be easy to bring this up uh, because it's a e simple and easy target. But you know, you heard just last week Ocasio-Cortez saying, well, if you're going to go after the facts and the law, sure, I might make a couple mistakes. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> but we also indicate that she doesn't care about the law and the facts because she's an absolute relativist and how she feels right is right is important or as we just heard in the news yesterday that one of the legislators for the state of I think it was South Dakota uh, said that um, oh the American flag is just a rag you know I, I hate it now, this is someone who is elected to be an official in a state government. And you would just take it for granted. But then the other representatives, including those who are veterans and were extremely offended, did not have a right to disagree with this and call him out for saying that the flag is just some rag that he hates. That was the other part, he hated the flag. Because there's not enough truth in between them upon which they can base a discussion on the meaning of patriotism. And they can't distinguish patriotic love of country from nationalistic jingoism. They just can't have a basis. Can't go on. And that applies, of course, in bigger areas in government. Now, government should be a place where everybody takes an oath to uphold the Constitution, right? That's part of getting into the government. And they don't agree that the Constitution should exist as it is, even though they've taken an oath. How much less do we have agreement 
when we are dealing with questions of the faith and its impact on what is right and wrong in everyday life. Matter of fact, uh, in talking recently to people in New York, or they come from New York and talking to others there, they say that Governor Cuomo is itching to have the church excommunicate him for his strong stance in favor of not only abortion, but abortion in the third trimester, and abortion that fails should be followed by killing the child if it survives the abortion. Even Roe v. Wade doesn't accept that. Roe v. Wade says that if a child is outside the womb, it is a person. Governor Cuomo is attacking even the principal Roe v. Wade. And he's itching to be excommunicated because that will be a feather in his pro-abortion cap. And there are other folks in New York, and by the way, keep in mind that in New York City, largest city of our country, 60% of all children conceived get aborted, and it's 85% of all African American children in New York are aborted. Anywhere else, this would be called genocide. And this is a major gap in culture. And the church is back on its heels. Because, well, for one reason, as the bishop spoke today, we've had a lot of bad shepherds who bought into the values of the sexual revolution and became abusive as a result. And that takes away the moral, and then also in a relativistic society, well, you know, this person has that kind of, you know, interests. And so I, I don't know if I can criticize it. There are folks who looked at that phenomenon through that relativistic lens. Well, you know, this is what they like to do. I mean, how can I criticize? Well, you can simply criticize it by saying, God forbids it. And they gave their word to be celibate. And they broke that word, and you did not say, you, you fell for the trick of relativism and the sexual revolution, and then as we will see constantly in this culture, that when you fall in for that trick, it, we, you find out too late that the sexual revolution is a way to entrap people and make them irrelevant. Again, as we see, people who get into the sexual revolution and then it gets out into the public and then they are stymied. They, uh, what's that, the guy, the owner of the uh, football team and lots of other people getting caught in the last couple days. This Harvey Weinstein getting caught in his acting out of the sexual revolution and then being turned against. That is yet exactly the kind of trick that goes on. As a matter of fact, with the sexual revolution, uh, a good example, this one time a lady in my studio audience asked me, Father Mitch, do you ever learn any spiritual lessons when you go hunting? I said, yes, ma'am. I remember one time in particular, I had taken a cotton ball, tied a string around it, dipped it in some dough and estrus scent, tied it to the back of my boot. And I walked a path where I knew deer had been walking. And I took it off my boot, hung it up in a branch, got in my stand, waited for dawn, and sure enough, 11 point buck came in. And that boy's nose was on the ground. He did not look up once. And he walked right into the sights of my rifle, bam, knocked him down. And I told the lady, the lesson you learn from that is 
sex makes you stupid and then you die. <laughs> Remember that story when you read newspaper headlines about all this stuff going on. It's the, these, the combination of the sexual drug revolution and this relativism is undoing us. Undoing us. And this is something that we have to add one other component to highlight. I mentioned it already, but I want to highlight it. We are dumbing down our culture. People know so much less history and science. I don't know if you saw the survey a little while, a couple years ago in London, where the folks over there thought that their breakfast cereal grew on trees. <laughs> There's a Cheerios tree and a Wheaties tree, and so on. They had no idea where their cereal came from. They really, I think there's something like 40% answered that it was uh, grown on trees. And I don't know if it came boxed or not, so somebody had a cartoon of one of our not so bright politicians with a box of Cheerios and calling that donut seeds. This is, <laughs> you know, this is, this is the kind of thing where this dumbing down is very real. In fact, there's a great book of one, one of my favorites. I always forget the author. He's a professor over at Emory University. His book is called The Dumbest Generation. And he points out how this dumbing down is taking place. And you see kids go up in their learning curve until age nine. And then at age nine, all the way through university, it's a steady decline in comparison to the de uh, decades earlier in the 20th century. And this is perplexing. We've got so much more information available. You can access the classics in the original and in translation. You can read so much and learn so much science, but the students are getting worse. Why is it? And the long and short of it was the social media. Because young people are so much into the social media and they're constantly texting their friends, usually about nonsense. And sometimes even worse than nonsense, sometimes very sinful things that they're posting about themselves and their friends. And instead of listening to adults, they stay in constant contact with their peers who know as little as they. And that seems to be the main factor. When I grew up in the 50s, when you cross the threshold of your house, your school, church, or your job, the motto of all adults was, kids are meant to be seen and <laughs> Well, sounds like my household <laughs> spread its message. <laughs> but that was just normal. Now, kids are constantly texting when at dinner and everywhere else, school, church, work, constantly texting, uh, and usually, again, it's nonsense. So they don't learn much. And in a democracy, where it's, you depend on having a well-informed voter population, this is a catastrophe. In a culture where truth is relativistic, therefore, it's not really a big deal if you know anything or not. By theory, that's not just accidental, it is a theory that it's not a big deal if you know stuff or not. And at that point, you see people become objects of manipulation. 
This is the problem when people don't know enough and are not willing to check things out. They become manipulated. So you had a group of uh, school children go to Senator Feinstein's office and say, well, what are you going to do to promote the green agenda that we have? You've got to get this is this is a purposely organized group called the Sunrise Generation Movement, where they are they are getting small children panicked over the claim that our the world is going to come to an end in 12 years if we don't get rid of cars, planes, and cows. <laughs> The cows have too much methane gas. <laughs> Sometimes I worry that there's too much methane gas of the same nature in Congress rather than in the pasture. <laughs> and they usually cost us more money than the cows do. It's but the, the problem is, and then you, again, there's that scene you can see on television of Ocasio-Cortez telling people, maybe it's immoral to have a hamburger at breakfast. Wow. This is amazingly manipulative. Or when, or when um, uh, Speaker Pelosi says, it's immoral to have a wall. Here's where the problem is. Maybe you shouldn't have a wall. Maybe you should. Maybe you should have a hamburger or not. But on what moral principle are you saying this? What is the moral law you are breaking by having a hamburger? They don't state the principle, so you cannot argue, because what they are doing is simply manipulating people emotionally. And the same thing is going on with uh, Pelosi's attitude on the wall. Maybe there should be a wall, maybe not. I want to see that argued logically. But to say that someone who happens to actually live behind a wall protecting her house is saying that it is immoral, I want to know the principle why wall around your house is moral and the one in the, in the country is not because you've got to stay principled. And once you do that, you then have to admit, well, there is something true that we're going against. And they can't do it anymore. They can't give us a reason why this is morally true or not. In fact, in our school system, it is decreed by the Supreme Court in 1980 that you may not display the Ten Commandments in a school. You may not, you cannot have those principles laid out. And in fact, when a kid went in Kentucky, defied the Supreme Court by wearing a t-shirt with the Ten Commandments on it, he was made to take it off. They can't have that. And so what do they do then? In place of having principles of morals and right and wrong, when they don't have a basis for those principles because they're relativists, what do they do? In our public schools for the last generation, they have been teaching positive self image. Positive self image. They can't say that it's right or wrong, but if you feel good about yourself, then the theory is you are less likely to be a bully. The problem with that theory is this, it's not true. The group that shows the highest self-confidence in our culture are the clinically sociopathic. <laughs> Sociopaths have zero doubt that they are right. Zero doubt. And they have a very high self-esteem and self-confidence. But they're crazy. <laughs> and mean at the same time. 
And the, the, the theory is not true. You have to have principles, but we live in a culture that cannot. Now, they also have a variety of principles, again, as Chris was talking on this, that little video, that makes our manhood and our masculinity toxic. That's even a phrase now. It's a thing, as they say in the world of cyberspace. Toxic masculinity. And this is highly problematic. That one of the genders, so that oh, so much so that Senator Hirono of uh, Hawaii said during the hearings uh, about the last Supreme Court judge, you men just shut up and stand up and do the right thing. Well, which one do you want us to do? <laughs> Is this multiple choice? I think she mainly wanted those who disagreed with her to shut up. Now, why is that important? Not only is it because she's addressing that only to one gender, which is, frankly, contrary to the various civil rights laws to single out people on the basis of their gender for being silent. Ah, but there I am using principles. Their own, but not the way they thought they would be used. I was just making them principles that are applicable to everybody. And that's not how they do their principles, is it? No, no, they want us to not think of that. But in addition to being that attempt to simply silence those who disagree with them, it shows another aspect of relativism. Namely, if there is no truth in between us, and if we cannot argue and discuss on the basis of what is objectively true, what other principle do we have as a way to make decisions? Might makes right. If I can shout you down, if I can tell you men to shut up and you listen, if I can use other kinds of social and perhaps even physical force to get you to do what I want, because I can't convince you because we don't have truth in between us. I can't argue with you, but I can force you. That is what the relativists are left with. Pay attention with that in mind, that might makes right within a relativistic worldview, because there's no basis in truth. It's right make, or might makes right. Then think about the Intifa movement with masks on their face, beating people up that they disagree with. Just happened again, the guy didn't wear a mask, and so now he's been arrested, but just on University of Southern California campus this week. Now the guy's beating up a conservative kid that didn't want to fight, who just, you know, cold cocks him. Because that's all they've got. They can't argue. They can't discuss. They can't disagree. And this is why it becomes extremely dangerous for our society to push down facts, the process of reason, and the ability of men to stand up for things that are right because they're right, and to stand up on the basis of principle, not just because every so often we need to fight somebody, but because we are men and are going to defend those who need defending, 
and defend the truth because it's true and live with honor because honor is worth living for and living by. Because they want all that part of our masculinity suppressed, they can get away with things. And what I think, you know, from Bishop Nine, what else has been saying today, that this is going to recall from us the opposite of what they expect. We very much have good principles. As a matter of fact, I love a line by uh, Archbishop Sheen, is that when other religions are investigated by reason, they tend to collapse. But when Catholicism is investigated by reason and reasonable means, it tends to highlight its greatness. Our truth comes forth as we apply reason. Why? Because we are convinced that the God who gives us the gift of faith also gave us the gift of reason and free will. That he gives us this ability and this charge to be wise. He gives us the Holy Spirit, which is a spirit of knowledge, understanding, and counsel, and courage. Read Isaiah chapter 11, first two verses, to see those gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that to see that is my goal. The culture easily uses the temptations of sexuality as distractions away from serious thought. So much so that there are websites on the internet to encourage men to masturbate more by, and use pornography and other things. But now there are more people going to the websites that discourage it. Why? Because you have men in college in particular, but also at work, who are saying, this is so distracting, I'm not doing my homework in college, I'm not doing my work. It's something that has a drug-like effect on us. And so pornography and self-abuse and uh, illicit relationships, all of that is something that they realize they have to remove from their lives whether they're religious or not, they can't get their tasks done. The sexuality that makes that buck stupid to the point of death makes us stupid to the point of inactivity and ineffectiveness. And it's not that we deny sexuality, that's not masculine either, but we learn to channel and direct and make it something that is a driving creative force. That's what sexuality is about. It's a creative force. Now, it's there to help create babies. But the same energy that gets dissipated on a lot of unchaste behavior can be redirected to becoming more creative forces in our society for what is good and true and reasonable. And that this is a part of who we are. That we don't have to become stupid and die. And don't let the culture sort of give us lots of pornography and other things as a sop that just keeps us from doing the task we ought to do, which is to stand up like men and not have all these things to hide, but to keep up forward our virtues, our knowledge, and our understanding. And especially we Catholics have so much to offer. We've got a 2,000 year tradition of great intellectual development and thought 
reflection and wisdom. Yeah, we've got a lot of sinners in the church. Like Zig Ziglar, who is from here in Texas, used to say, of course there are a lot of hypocrites in church. Come on in and join the rest of us. There's room for one more. <laughs> sure we got that. But there's also a tremendous history of wisdom and goodness and self-restraint on people. And this is something that we have to know the facts about. I'll give an example. How many of you have heard it said in schools, some of you are still in school, or when you were in school, or you hear it in the media, religion is the biggest cause of war in history. How many of you ever hear that? Raise your hand. How many have never heard it? Not too many, just a couple. Good. Because it's not true. It's not even close to being true. Well, what about the Crusades? Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crusades lasted 250 years. You know how many people died in the Crusades? 650,000. That's 50,000 less than died in four years of the Civil War in this country. Ever think about that perspective? It was less than died in the Civil War to defend the principle. Remember what the Civil War was about. Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court said that people of African descent are inherently inferior and ought to be slaves because they are inherently inferior. By the way, a teaching that also was later on pre presented by Charles Darwin in his second book, um, uh, uh, his first book, The uh, Origin of Species, didn't mention it, but in Descent of Man, he mentions that Africans are a species in between the ape and the human being, but they're not humans. This was commonly thought. And Abraham Lincoln and others saw that the Whig Party was absolutely useless on this issue, and that's why they started the Republican Party on the principle that the Declaration of Independence says that all men have un are created equal and have unalienable rights from their creator. The, Supreme, the Democrat Party argued, no, the Supreme Court said that they are inferior. That's the law of the land and slavery is therefore the law of the land. And that set the argument. You see it in Lincoln-Douglas debates. I hope some of you have read those, if not all of you. That's a good use of the internet. It's all on there. And you see that this is you know, what led to a war that killed 50,000 more people in four years than died in 250 years of the Crusades. And when you take all the deaths in Christian wars of religion, including the crusade, uh, the uh, Inquisition, oh, the Inquisition, dun, 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 well, about less than 5,000 people died at the hands of the Inquisition over a 600-year period. The number of people who died in Christian wars and persecutions and such, perpetrated by Christians against each other and others, is two and a quarter million. And they keep throwing out religion the biggest cause of war. It's terrible. You can't have religion. And therefore you can't have basic principles that claim to be true because people kill each other by the noons. Two and a quarter million. Whereas relativistic people read Mein Kampf, if you get a copy somewhere, Hitler was a relativist. He denied that there was any such thing as absolute truth and absolute morality. And then he lived it out. And so did Lenin and Stalin. And so at the hands of the, the National Socialists, short name the Nazis, 50 million people died in World War II. 
Another 25 million died in World War I in the name of nationalism. And the Soviets killed 61.9 million of their own people and the Chinese even more, so that for the 20th century of atheistic and nationalistic wars, 305 million people were killed. That's more than 150 times as many died in Christian wars at the hands of atheists. We're not the danger. And we have to know these facts and other facts. In the face of a culture that is declining in knowledge, we have to become more knowledgeable about our faith, about the principles for morality, and about our country's history. To know about the principles and the facts of history, both. This is our task. And in this way, we become another type of cultural warrior who's not promoting one political party versus another. I keep my eye on both of them, frankly. I want to promote Jesus Christ, as the bishop said, we keep our gaze on Jesus. I want to promote his church and the truth of his gospel, the fa real facts of history, and I want to be a patriot, which comes, by the way, from the Latin word pater, meaning father. To have a patriotic love of the country and a defense of the principles that underlie it and not blind nationalism by any means. These are tasks that we have as men. And as we become that kind of warrior in the world of ideas, as well as saying that we will be counter-revolutionaries against the drug revolution and the sexual revolution, we will be those who fight against those revolutions and oppose the destruction of our families. Because it's not neutral that men abandon their children. It is not a neutral fact. Children born into families where the parents are not married, therefore not committed to each other, therefore not committed to their children, those children are number one group of the poor. Most of our poor in this country come from unmarried children and their moms. They're also the least likely to finish high school, let alone college. They are very likely to use drugs. 60% of the girls, probably a higher percent of the boys, will become unwed parents. And 80% of all Prison inmates are the children of unmarried parents. Number one indicator they'll be, and that has no regard to race. It's 80% of the black guys, the white guys, and the Hispanic guys. Oh, Asians are missing in that group because they don't have the, as big a problem of unmarried parenthood. This is something that we stand up as counter-revolutionaries to the sexual revolution, the drug revolution, and as warriors for knowledge and truth. So that as it says in Isaiah 11, we gird on truth as our loincloth. In other words, truth is our underwear. It's in your Bible. My translation is in there. <laughs> and in this way, we serve Christ, our families, and our nation. And that is the audience we most want to please. Thank you.
Thank you.